Uh, thanks to uh, those of you who cheered when he said Kansas City Chiefs, the righteous faithful. We're, uh, we're glad you're here today. Uh, the rest of you, it's a great day to repent and turn to God. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about. Hey, if you were to ask, if you were to ask me and say, Stan, uh, what's, what's new life all about? Um, I would say to you, the new life is all about being a church that um, makes disciples, that will make disciples, that will plant churches, that will plant more churches. New life wants to see a disciple-making movement happen in our generation, one in which reaches neighborhoods and uh, counties and states and nations, the globe. Like, we want to be a part of transforming the face of the earth to the glory of God. It's for his glory, his honor. He calls us to it, and God is worth every ounce of energy and effort we can give to making disciples. In order to become the kind of church and the kind of people <clears throat> that will make disciples, that will make disciples, that will reach the ends of the globe, in order to do that, we're going to have to change how we think just a little bit. We have to change how we think, and we have to almost picture faith and Christianity through the lens of, of an adventure, more of a journey that we're being called into, an adventure that, that Christ is inviting us into. Uh, recently, my family and I, we, uh, over Christmas break, after Christmas, we spent a little bit of time in Colorado. My mom has a timeshare uh, all over the place, whatever, and she invited us to Granby, Colorado. And so my family, we went out there and uh, we spent some time uh, with family out in the mountains and the Rockies. Uh, the highlight of the trip was skiing um, at Granby Resort in Colorado. Uh, now, I've got a picture for you guys from the back deck of my timeshare. Uh, this was our view for about four or five days. Um, people have said to me before, um, you know, why, why do you want to move to Colorado? Oh, uh, uh, I mean, that's why. Uh, exhibit A right here, uh, why I would love to live in Colorado at some point someday. I used to live there as a child, but um, how many of you have ever been skiing before? Ski, snowboard, whatever. You've been up and down a mountain on dangerous, you know, yeah, things on your feet, right? Um, so you've skied. How many of you have skied or done snowboarding in the Rockies? Okay, that's a, that's a different level, right? That's a different thing than going over to Massanutten. I have nothing against it, but the Rockies, it's just a whole different animal. Somebody came up to me after the last service and they said, we love skiing. Uh, we've skied a lot, uh, but we can do you better. I'm like, really? They said, yes. We were missionaries in uh, the Swiss Alps at a Christian camp, and we used to love to ski the Swiss Alps. And I said, you're right. That's the next level up, right? Massanut and the Rockies and then the Swiss Alps. Um, but the, the great thing about a ski resort, the great thing about going skiing um, is that every single person who will ever put on skis or a snowboard to learn the, the, this athletic thing, anybody who ever does it, every single person starts at the exact same place. Every single person starts at the lodge. The lodge is at the base of the mountain, and it's where everything happens. At the lodge, you get your lift ticket. At the lodge, you get fitted for your boots. You make sure the bindings fit so that the boots go in the ski ride or the boots go in your snowboard ride. Uh, you get everything you need is there. Your hot chocolate is there. The fireplace is there. Every, every single person starts at the lodge. The trainers are there. If you've never skied before, you need to go to the lodge because they're going to help you get connected to an instructor. The instructor is going to take you out to the little learner slope and you're going to learn the basics of skiing or snowboarding. And then what's going to happen is you're going to progress. You're going to ski the little learner mountain that they have for you. It's a hill that would fit in your backyard is what that is. Uh, it's like skiing in your backyard. You're going to do that. And then you're going to go to a little bit bigger hill and go to a bunny slope, and you're going to practice going down the bunny slope, and then you're going to get to sit on the ski lift, and then you're going to work your way up the ski lift. You're going to go halfway up the mountain or so, and you're going to get to the top of the hill, and you're going to look down, and you're going to go, this is way, way bigger than the bunny slope. Like, that's like, I can see, you know, this other state over there. How did I get up here, right? And then you're going to work your way down some greens, nice, easy slopes, and you're going to get better and better and progress. 
Then you're going to work your way up to a blue run and then a black one and then a double black. And then if you're really adventurous, like I used to be, you're going to make your own runs. You're going to look at the map and not see what run you can ski, but you're going to look and see how many you can cut across and make your own path through all the trees. We call them tree runs. Anybody like to do a good tree run? Yeah, those are my people right there. Those are my people. Get a good tree run. How many runs can I run across? How many jumps through the trees? How many trees can I avoid and not die? Like, that is real living right there, okay? Every single person who ever gets to that point, they all started at the exact same place. They all started at the lodge. They all started with a trainer. I look at that and I see an adventure. I see excitement. I see risk. I see fun. And then I look and I see the progression of development and growth. And I say, man, that's what I want in every area of my life. I want that in my faith. How do I grow as a a father, as a Christian father? How do I grow as a Christian husband? How do I grow in ministry? What's next? How do I get from the green run to the blue run to the black run to the double to the whatever? How do I progress? Because nobody, I think, ultimately, nobody really wants to just be stuck, right? We, at whatever level of adventure we're willing to go to, we at least want to progress, Nobody wants to just be stuck forever. You look to get out of comfort zones. They're nice for a while, but you look to get out of it, to grow and to progress and to move to the next thing. So I I see this in faith and in church, and then I read about this guy. read about this man named Jesus, and I go to the Gospels, and I read his story And man, what I get there, the picture I see of this man named Jesus is something very, very different than what I think a lot of churches tend to present. You get connected to this guy, Jesus, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you have passages like this in John 10, 10. I've come that you'd have life and have it in abundance. When Jesus gets close to you, water turns into wine. The deaf hear He mixes mud and saliva and blind people can now see. He takes a schoolboy's lunch and feeds thousands and thousands of people with leftovers. And then the dead rise. And then in the middle of the night in a storm on the open sea, he comes along to you and me and he says, let's walk on water. That's an adventurous Jesus. That's a Jesus who, who is further and a little bit, little bit more out there maybe than, than we're used to seeing, right? Because it seems somewhere along the way in our, in our world, we've gotten to the point where the big adventure of Christianity is to come back next Sunday. Just come back next Sunday. And we're going to preach a sermon on seven ways uh, to get to your best life now. Come back next Sunday and we're going to preach a sermon on this one other thing. And then you're, you're going you're gonna to want to hear it. You can't miss. You got to be. Just come back next Sunday, warm your seat, and hear your, the seven steps to saving your marriage. Uh, come next Sunday. Our pastor is going to zip line onto the stage from the back of the auditorium. You got to come next Sunday. I mean, it, it just is that the grand adventure of Christianity? Come next Sunday, come next Sunday, come next Sunday. And if you really like it, leave us a tip at the end of the service. We'll pass some bags around. And if it was, if it was a good enough thing for you, you know, leave us a tip, and then, uh, you know, we'll be able to tell, you know, what you really like. Is that really the best that Christianity has to offer? Surely, there's more to following Jesus than showing up next Sunday. Surely, there has to be more than this. I want to invite you to the lodge I want to invite you to the room, to the place at the base of the mountain where everybody starts, where everybody's at a common spot. Whether you've followed Jesus for 10 or 20 or 30 years, whether you've known him for a long time and you've given your life to him, it doesn't matter. I'm going to reintroduce you to Jesus. And if you're here for the very first time and you're skeptical, you don't believe, you don't know where you land on the spectrum of faith, you're going to start at the exact same place with the rest of us. We are going to be introduced to Jesus. 
at the lodge, and we are going to be invited into an adventure of hearing his voice and following that will lead us to a place of adventure and making disciples that will make disciples that will lead to the transformation of the entire planet. Before we're introduced to Jesus, let's pause and have a word of prayer. Father, we pray you would be with us for the next few moments together. Father, I pray that you would speak to each person who is here today, that we would hear your voice, we would obey, and we would follow you. Father, may there be so much more that you enlighten us to, that you show us toward so much more in this life, in this adventure of following you than maybe what we're currently experiencing. May we hear your voice and obey. It's in your son's name we pray these things. Amen. The adventure of following Jesus begins when we're introduced to Jesus. You can't be in an adventure following somebody if you've never been introduced to them and you don't know them. The, the adventure starts at the lodge where everybody is on the same footing, the same ground being introduced to Jesus. And I love how Jesus introduces himself to us. In Mark chapter 1, after John was arrested, that's John the Baptist, his cousin, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus introduces himself by saying that the time has come, that God's kingdom has finally come near, that everything is about to change. All that God has been working toward in his story, in history, is coming to this moment. The time is fulfilled. And Jesus makes his introduction in his introduction to us about himself. He makes within it an appeal. And his appeal is, move away from false beliefs. Everything is about to change. All that you thought you knew that was true is not. The time has come. God's kingdom is near. It is time to radically change what you thought you knew. Move away from false beliefs. A couple weeks ago, Jeff McDaniel was here and he spoke entire message on that topic. And so I'm not going to rehash all those details for you. Go back and watch it if you want to catch up. It's It's a great message. But I'll say this. Every single person walking on the planet lives and acts out of a belief. There's a core belief inside of us that comes up and goes out into action. And the way we do things shows the stuff that we believe on the inside. And now what happens when we begin to believe false things at the core of who we are, the end result of those actions become pain, chaos, fear, shame, guilt. It ends up in a negative place because we are acting and living and believing based on a lie. And so Jesus says, the time has come. It's all about to change. Everything you thought you knew was right is not. It is time to move away from false beliefs. Let me give you an example. Years ago, before I was on staff at New Life, I was in another ministry. I've been in full-time ministry for, I don't know, almost 20 years, 18 or 19 years, something like that. Years ago, before I came to New Life, um, I was not in a very good place. I was going through a really dark season. Um, I was just, stuff was not good. I was not in a healthy place. And I had gotten to a point where my thought process was, I'm not good at this. I, I shouldn't be doing ministry. I should clock in and clock out somewhere. I, I don't think I can do this. And through this process of trying to figure out where that was coming from, I started to walk with a couple of guys and they were coming alongside trying to shed some light onto onto why I was kind of feeling the way that I was. And I started to discover some very unsettling things. I started to discover within myself some beliefs that were were false, that were lies. Um, I believed that I was not good enough, that I was not uh, worthy that I had to earn God's love. And where that led me in my ministry journey was to a place where I wasn't leading my church because I wanted to reach people for a good reason or heal people for a good reason or restore marriages for a good reason. I wanted to reach those people because I wanted them to come to my church so that my church got really big so that people would notice me and that I would feel valued. God, if you can just let me grow this thing really big, you'll see how worthy I am. And so I led a church years ago from a place of shame 
in a place of self-promotion. Maybe you've been there before and maybe you're there right now. Struggle with an addiction? I guarantee you at the core of that addiction is a false belief about who you are and your worth and who you are in God's eyes. And so because you have a false belief about that, you have to fill the void with something. I, I, at the base of your addiction is a false belief. Uh, maybe you've had an affair. Maybe you're recovering from one or trying to overcome or you're on whichever side of that. At the, at the core of, a, of an affair is a false belief. A false belief about whether or not God will fulfill, whether or not your spouse will, whatever. And so then you act out of a false belief and you end up in chaos and pain and hurt. Maybe you're sitting here right now and you believe the lie as a Patriots fan that your team can win without cheating. <laughs> you know, that is a false belief. And it's a good thing you're here today as a Patriots fan because it's, we're going to repent today. <laughs> and so it's a good thing that you're here. But for us, it's really not just about, uh, uh, you know, legalistically uh, changing the behavior and saying, here's the list of everything not to do. Just don't do the, we don't care about the condition of your heart. Just don't do this list. Don't commit these sins. Don't say these words. Don't watch these movies. Here's the list. Just do that. We don't care. We, we get to that point and we tend to mess this up a little bit because at the core, underneath all that's really just a lie. God is not going to fulfill me. So I'm going to have to follow my heart. God won't provide. So I'm going to have to make the money and push the career and get promotions. I'm going to put all my energy and identity into my career. God isn't really good. So I'm going to have to fight for my way. God doesn't really love me. So I'm going to go look for love in places I shouldn't look. It's not just a matter of, of, of a moral list or a good to do list. Because if that were the case, Jesus is speaking to a really weird audience for that. He's speaking to the Jewish people who have been God's people for 2,000 years. They've got the list. They've got them. They've got the to-dos. God wrote them down for them. Like they've got the list. So if it's just about a list of to-dos, Jesus seems to have picked the wrong audience. But Jesus comes along and says, the time's fulfilled. God's kingdom is near. Everything you've ever thought to be true is about to change. Everything that God has been orchestrating in history is coming into reality. Move away from false beliefs. He moves us away from them when he uses the words repent and believe. Transforming your life completely to the glory and the honor of God begins with repentance and new beliefs. Taking the false beliefs, removing them, confessing them to God, and allowing God to replace the false beliefs with truth. So what role do repentance and belief play in this whole process of being introduced to Jesus? Well, repent is not a word that we use in our um, vernacular very often. I don't hear many people walking around saying repent. Like I, that's not common language for us. Um, as crazy it is, as it is, we don't use that word often, but it is one of the most beautiful, one of the most powerful, one of the most transforming words I believe in the entire New Testament. Now, just to kind of keep it really simple for us, repent simply means to change your mind, to, to turn back, that something new enters your head and you're going this way and you go, now I'm gonna change my mind, I'm gonna go back this other way. And it's just kind of this mental shift that takes place when you come upon some new information. So Jesus, when he says, repent, he's asking us to change our minds about something about something we've believed to be true, now replace that because it's false, replace it with a new truth, my truth. So he's asking us to change how we think about it, not because he's trying to give us a list of rules of to-dos and don'ts, because he's a, he's a you know, cosmic killjoy, but because actually repentance is the best thing for us. Acts chapter three says, therefore repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Who could really use a season of refreshing in their marriage from the presence of God? Who could really use a season of refreshing in how you handle things with your children that would only come from the presence of God? 
Who could really use a season of refreshing with the political climate and all the chaos that seems to be in our society right now? Who could really use a season of refreshing that only comes from the presence of God? That only happens when you repent. Repent, change your mind. There's something you believe that is not true. Move away from it. Change how you think and allow God to refresh you. Belief comes in many forms. It's so closely associated with repent. It also ties into faith. It ties into obedience. And pretty soon they all sound like the exact same word. And it's a big jumbled cycle where they all play off of each other. But belief is also one of these powerfully transformative words in the New Testament. To keep it simple, it means be convinced of. To be convinced to the point, to be persuaded to the point that you believe something so deeply <clears throat> that you move into action and obedience to now persuade somebody else to, be the, to believe the same thing. It is a conviction inside that moves us toward obedience. It is the same level of belief as an essential oil salesperson. I call them oilpreneurs, okay? <laughs> the oilpreneurs who say, just rub some frankincense on it, you'll be fine, okay? That same level of belief and conviction and persuasion that now says, I want to persuade and convince everybody else. I'm convinced I believe the Chiefs are going to the Super Bowl. I just, I think we are, especially after yesterday's game. I think this is the best shot we've had in decades. I believe we're going to the Super Bowl. I believe cats are, or dogs are better than cats. Okay, I believe that is God's holy truth, right? The dogs are better than cats. You have beliefs. You have certain beliefs about your boss, certain beliefs about your spouse, certain beliefs about the climate, certain beliefs about politics. Now, what's interesting is that sometimes our beliefs just become a, a mental ascent. It's just something that we learn and now we know, but we don't actually act on it. This is where biblical belief separates itself. Biblical belief separates itself and says, if you don't act in obedience, if you don't move what you claim to believe into action, then you don't actually believe. Here's how this plays out. I believe the chiefs are going to the Super Bowl. I'm not buying a ticket. Part of the reason, I can't afford a Super Bowl ticket. <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest. I can't afford a Super Bowl ticket. But what if as a Chiefs fan, I buy a Super Bowl ticket? And what if the Titans go to the Super Bowl? I mean, how embarrassing is that, you know? Like, who wants to go to the Super Bowl and watch the Titans? Except for the few Titans fans, right? Like, but as a Chiefs fan, I don't know that I really believe it enough to take the action of buying the ticket, right? That's how it is for us. This is where biblical belief separates itself, that you are so deeply convinced of something that you act, you obey. This is the story of, of Abraham. Um, Abraham's story is summed up in Romans chapter 4, where Romans 4 says that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness, so here's the story. God shows up in Abraham's life and he says, pack up everything you have, your family, your, your, your cattle, all of it, and I take it to a place I will show you. I'm not even going to tell you where the end place is. I just want you to pack up everything you've ever known, start to follow me, I'll let you know when we get there. Abraham in that moment doesn't say, I believe you'll get me there. And then continue sitting in his lazy boy sipping tea. Doesn't do that. His, his faith was credited to him as righteousness. Because when God said, pack up everything and move to some land I'm going to show you. He went, okay. Packed up his stuff and acted. And moved in obedience. And took a step and followed God. And so it was credited to him as righteousness. We begin the journey, the adventure of hearing the voice of Jesus, following him, doing all that he has called us to do, experiencing so much more in life when we say, yes, I believe and I'm off and I'm running. Repent and believe. 
This is where the rest of Jesus' invitation comes into play because he didn't finish his sentence there. He finishes it by saying, repent and believe the good news. Now, if you've been around church at all for five seconds or 20 years or whatever, we typically equate, we say that the good news equals the gospel, that the gospel message of Jesus is good news. And that is true. The gospel is good news to those who believe like that is all well and good. But a lot of times the way we treat the gospel is Christians sometimes will treat the gospel as if it is our ticket punch card to get into heaven. Jesus died for me. I said the prayer. I believe. I did the one thing. I checked that one box. Now I get heaven. And we, we sometimes treat the gospel, the good news of Jesus, as if it's not really going to affect our day-to-day -day life. It's just the punch card to get us over here into heaven for all of eternity. There's one problem with that approach. The problem with that approach is that Jesus said, repent and believe the good news before he died. At the point when he asked us to repent and believe the good news, yes, the good news includes the death of Jesus and his resurrection and heaven. and all, It includes all of that. <clears throat> but when he says it, he hasn't died yet. There has been no cross. There has been no atonement for sin, no payment for sin. There is, there is no reconciliation to God yet at this point. The work has not been completed. So what is the good news that we are supposed to repent and to believe if the stuff we typically equate with the good news hadn't even happened when Jesus introduces us to it? What are we supposed to believe? At the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches this powerful sermon. I'm talking hellfire and brimstone type, like old school, like put yourself back at, you know, some place in the 40s or 50s or something like, you know, one of those ones that if I started preaching that way, none of you would come back next week kind of a thing, right? I mean, like he is pulpit pounding, letting people have it. He gets to the end of his sermon, Acts chapter 2, verse 36, and in verse 36, he tells you in one sentence the entire purpose of his sermon. He sums all of it up in one sentence, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty. May the house of Israel be convinced, be persuaded, believe what I'm telling you with certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. They were convicted. They're cut to the heart. They said to Peter, what do we do? What should we do? Peter replied, repent. Repent means change your mind. What do they need to change their mind about? The false belief they had held about who Jesus is. They killed a man that they believed to be a rebel, somebody trying to stir up trouble, somebody trying to cause problems. They didn't believe that they killed the Messiah. They believe they crucified a crazy liar who, who was trying to create chaos for the Jewish people. And so when Peter confronts them and said, no, 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 you crucified the king, you crucified the savior, you need to change your mind about the identity of Jesus. So when we talk a lot about baptism, the foundational part of baptism is saying, I am not king. I am not savior. I need to change what I think about Jesus. Let it be known for certain that he is Lord and Messiah. The first one, Jesus is king. Jesus is master of all things. He is, he is from the beginning. He is one with God. He is God. The universe was created for him. The entirety of God's story is about Jesus. The Old Testament says he's coming. The gospels say, here I am. And then the epistles at the end of the book go, that was him. The entirety of God's story says Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Colossians chapter one, for everything was created by Jesus in heaven and on earth, the visible, the invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. 
He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is the beginning, first place in everything. That verse goes on to say that through him we are reconciled to God because of his shed blood on the cross. Jesus is king. He's not someone to trifle with that you get to force to kind of meet how you think the thing should operate. Jesus is the king that all of this was created for by him. And when he speaks, he holds it together. That's Jesus. Let the house of new life know for certain that Jesus is the king, that he is the Lord. Through him, all of us are reconciled to God. When I confronted my, um, when I confronted my, my, my pain in ministry years ago, one of the things I found at the bottom of it was that I was really interested. That at, the, at the root of my ministry, I was the king of my ministry. That I wanted people to look at me and see me. When I entered the ministry, I was reading books by a guy by the name of Rick Warren. And when I entered the ministry, my thought, I had a conscious thought that in ministry I would be so successful. My thought was, I hope people forget Rick Warren's name because I want them to know who I am. When you have that thought, guess who's king? Me. Guess who's not? Jesus. There's only one throne. There's only one throne and the source and the root of my problem was I am king. Answer this question for yourself if you're struggling to know who's king of your life. Here's some filters. Who gets the final word on your finances? Who gets the final word on your marriage? Who gets the final word on your parenting, on your career, on your sex life? On your faith, who gets the final call? You? Is there enough truth in you to come up with on your own to be able to pull that off? Or does the truth belong to someone else? Jesus is the king. And then it says, Jesus is both Lord and Messiah. He is king and savior. Jesus says in Matthew or Luke chapter 19, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus didn't come to earth for no purpose. Jesus came to earth for a very specific purpose. So if Jesus comes to earth as savior, what does that mean we need to believe? We need to believe that someone was lost and needed saving. See, I think I'm convinced that the thing that keeps us from taking next steps that we should be taking, I'm convinced that what it is, is we believe we don't need it, then we're not really all that lost, right? We come to church because it feels good. We can check a box. We feel pretty good about ourselves because we were there. And then we kind of, we, we, we move on with our, our week, with our life, but, but we're kind of missing something in all that. We, we think that was a good sermon. That was for that other guy. Cause I'm, I'm not really that bad. I've never killed anyone. So I'm not really, that's not for me. And so what, what prevents us sometimes from taking the next step from following Jesus in the adventure is simply we don't believe we need it. I'm not that lost. Preacher, I can handle it. I've got things under control. I'm doing just fine. I can, I can handle it until I can't. I can save my marriage on my own power until I can't. I can, I can fix my finances and, until I can't. I've been talking with a guy for a little while now and he sent me a text message this week. I'm just gonna read part of it for you. He said, I'm empty, full of shame and guilt. I act charismatic and tell pride-filled, egotistical stories full of sin and adventure to give the appearance I am my own God, a self-made man, but I am truly empty with more pain in my heart than you could ever believe. I woke up to that text this, this past week. It was sent in the middle of the night. Let me be honest with you guys. I'm lost without Jesus, and I believe you're lost without Jesus. I believe lies that put myself on the throne that lead to darkness and despair and chaos and shame and guilt. I believe false things that I shouldn't believe. 
that put me in a place to say, I am lost. It was true in the biblical narrative for multiple characters. It's true for each of us. I don't obey the way I'm called because so often I don't believe I'm the one that needs it. That's the one for someone else. I'm not that lost. I'm, I'm good. I got this. That's a false belief that leads me to despair and chaos. I believe one lie, it spreads across my entire life. Eve believed one lie and it spread to all of humanity. Romans 3, 23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all lost. Jesus is savior, which means someone needs saving. That's us. We need saving. Friends, Jesus would say the time has come. Move away from false beliefs. Repent and believe the good news that I am the king and I am here to save you. Come back to the lodge with me for just a minute. In the lodge in the corner is a fireplace and it's cold outside. So there's people over here warming themselves by the fireplace over here. You can go and get your hot chocolate. You're coming from the hot chocolate. You're walking back to the fire to warm up and you're walking super clumsily because these boots are not made for walking. I mean, these things are just the absolute, just the absolute worst. You look like a total dork and you fall down the stairs. I mean, it's just terrible. These boots are just awful. And you walk yourself over to the fire and who is sitting in front of the fire? Jesus is sitting in front of the fire and Jesus sits you down and he looks at you and he looks at you in the eye and he invites you into an adventure. He says, the time has come. It is fulfilled. It's now. God's kingdom is near. You have no idea. Everything is about to change. Everything you thought to be true is not you guys got to see what's coming. Repent and believe because I'm about to change all of this. Repent and believe the good news. I am king and I am here to save you. The question from Jesus then becomes, so what's next? When Jesus invites you to that adventure, the question simply becomes the question of what's the next step? Maybe for you, it's something like just being honest about a false belief. Looking deep inside and confronting the stuff that you believe about God and about yourself that are not true and that are preventing you from following, from following Christ. Confession in the Bible means to say the same thing as. It means to come into agreement with someone. So when Jesus says, I am king and I am savior, what we confess is, you're right. You are king and you are savior. And what I have believed all this time that I am king and that I, that's not right. Jesus, I agree with you. I confess that I have believed the lie. I agree with you. You are the king. That's confession. I say the same, and I am putting myself in agreement with the same thing that Jesus Christ says about himself. Maybe for you, it's confession. Maybe you need to wrestle with the identity of Jesus. You know, Jesus' disciples had to wrestle with the identity of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus comes along, they're having a conversation, and he says, who do people say that I am? That's a really easy question, because then you get to talk about those people over there, and that's really easy. And they say, some people say, you're Elijah. Some say, John the Baptist resurrected. Some say, you're, you're Jeremiah. Some say, you're one of the other prophets. They have all these ideas of who Jesus is. But then Jesus goes one step further. He makes it really personal. He says, but who do you say I am? You're sitting in the lodge, you're out in front of the fire, Jesus is looking at you, inviting you on an adventure of a lifetime, and he says, who do you say I am? Now you have to answer. Who is he? See, the disciples had to wrestle with the identity of Jesus. Simon Peter in verse 16, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Who do you say Jesus is? Because when you're introduced to him, he is the king and he is the savior and you have to surrender to who Jesus says he is. Who is he? Who do you, who do you say Jesus is? 
We also know that we grow by and through commitment to action. We don't, we don't grow toward it. I don't get really fit this year in 2020 by thinking about how good it'll be in December. I have to, <clears throat> I have to take an action step. I have to eat better and I have to work out. What commitment will you make? What commitment will you make right now that says, I will put a stake in the ground and I will move forward? Maybe the step for you is baptism. Maybe the step for you is going to take five or going to discover discipleship on the 26th when it's offered and saying, I'm wrestling with who Jesus is. I'm wrestling with these questions. Someone walk with me and to get connected and to begin to wrestle with the very identity of Jesus Christ. When Jesus invites you on the adventure, he looks you square in the eyes and he says, what's your next step? What will you do next? What step do you need to take? Let's pray together. Father, we, we admit that we so often believe lies about you Lies about you that lead us to chaos, lead us to sin, lead us to a place of false beliefs. Father, I pray that today would be a day of repentance, of refreshing, of renewal that only comes from you. That today, God, we would confess our false beliefs, that we would lay them before you. Then you would replace lies that we have maybe believed for decades and decades. That God, you would replace them with your truth that you have created us in your image, that you love us, that you've sent your son for us, that he is the king of the universe and we don't have to carry the burden of trying to be our own king. And that we can believe that he has come and he is going to save us and that he has through the cross reconciled us back to the, to the father through his shed blood. Father, may you replace lies with truth. And may today be a day of commitment and action and obedience, bold obedience to follow you, to hear your voice and to follow, to hear your voice and obey that Jesus, you are King, you are Savior, and may we surrender to you and walk accordingly. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for all you have done for us. In your son's name, we pray these things. Amen.